Welcome to Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan, the golf podcast that interviews the best and brightest minds in the golf industry. Now, here's your host, Bernard Sheridan. Brian, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks so much for being with us here today. Uh, thanks for having me, Bernie. So, Brian, the first question that we ask every every one of our guests is, when is the very first time that you picked up a golf club? <laughs> that's, that's pretty interesting. I, I had a brief encounter when I was about 20 years old. Uh, my one brother was athletic in high school. And he golfed with the uh, schools and stuff, and uh, he tried to talk me into trying it. Uh, it just didn't take at that time, a <laughs> uh, couple years. And I just, uh, never, never really picked up the, uh, desire to do it. So I kind of give it up, uh, spent my whole life, uh, working as a machinist. And, uh, my wife, uh, a few years back decided that she was getting close to retirement and her sister golf. And she said she wanted to start golfing. <laughs> I says, go ahead. Uh, whatever. So she got a set of clubs from her sister and she come home one day and she says, I want you to go to the driving range and tell me what I should be doing. And I says, I'm a bowler, not a golfer, but I says, I'll go out and watch. And, uh, so we go out to the driving range and I seen a couple things that I thought maybe I could tell her to change. And, and, uh, she hit a bunch of balls and she looked at me and she says, why don't you, why don't you hit a few? And I said, ah, I'm good. I did it before. I'm good. And she kept needling me. So I, uh, picked up a club and hit some and she looked at me and she says, uh, see, it's, it's something we could do together. <laughs> so I says, all right. <laughs> yeah, really. I says, if you want me to start golfing so we can go out golfing together, fine. And, uh, that was only about eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. Uh, well beyond what mo most people start. Uh, Biggest thing I, I got out of it is I worked night shift as a supervisor in a machine shop. And it's so hard to sleep in the daytime. I'd come home and I'd be up for four or five, six hours and then try to get enough sleep to go to work the next night. Once I started golf and I'd go to uh, one of the local courses called Lucky Hills. Uh, and, of course, I would pick one of the toughest nine-hole courses around. And... But I would walk it, and uh, it was great. I, I, I loved being out there. I loved walking the course, and long and short, after two or three hours walking the course and coming home, I seemed to be able to go to sleep better. And after a few years, I, uh, you know, it only takes that one good shot, and you keep coming back. And I finally got uh, to the point where I was interested and. In, uh, now we're both retired and once I retired, that's, if it's nice outside and I don't have anything else that I got to do, I'm on a golf course somewhere. Even if it's by myself, I'm out there. <laughs> yeah. I, I know I've played many, many rounds by myself and have met all different kinds of people that way, which has been really, um, nice. I mean, that's one of the things that I love the most about golf is the social aspect of it. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a lot nicer if you have a group. To golf with but uh i'm i'm the type that uh if i've got time on my hands i'm not going to sit around the house doing nothing i'm getting out in a course yeah uh, at, at least in the summer up here of course uh now i do have the ability to, to golf in a simulator up here that's real close at our local course and i actually help them run at a time so well that's good so so you have a product and i guess because because you're a machinist um, it got you thinking about this product. And so, so when was the first idea that you decided to come up with, with first, first of all, let's, let's just say, um, let, let's, let's share, let's share the product real quick. So yeah. it's, it's, it's basically a divot tool. Your most, most of your standard divot tools are just a flat divot tool. Uh, the reason I thought of this, uh, is because, Myself, when I'd go out golfing, whether I was walking in a cart or whatever, uh, I would be at least three or four holes before I'd remember to get it out of my bag. And uh, 
you know, if it's 50 feet away in your bag, you either walk back or you reach in your pocket and get the keys out for your vehicle and try it or a tee. And, and I don't know whether when I hit a tee the first time I crack it, but every time I try to fix them with a tee, it just break on me. So I got to thinking here about two summers ago, why, why can't you attach this to your club somehow? And, uh, I basically got, uh, originally what it was was one of the clips that you hang on the outside of your bag right so that you can hang your putter on the outside of the bag yes and i cut the back of that off i uh, used shaft glue for a club glued it to a standard divot tool from uh uh our local sporting goods store and i put it on my club and went down to uh the local course i golf all the time lucky hills and the first nine holes i golfed down there I had two or three people ask me what it was and where did I get it? Well, uh, naturally, I took it off my club because I got to thinking about this. Maybe I got something here. I uh, did an extensive search on the Internet. Uh, there basically was nothing out there that attached your club as far as a divot tool. So I went to Home Invention Company, and uh, that process, they were supposed to help me find somebody to market it and manufacture it. Uh, I got patent pending through them, uh, but they never found anybody to go any further with it. So I started looking myself, is it possible to do this on my own? Can I find somebody to make these? And fortunately, I found a company in Georgia that uh, was interested. He told me he could make them for me, but he wasn't interested in uh, the retail side of it. But I think that was because he has his own. He's been in the golf accessory business himself since, I think, 2005. Okay. So I think it was more of a conflict of interest of his own products. Sure. That he didn't want to uh, market it for me. Of course. Uh, but I decided, you know, <laughs> I've got patent pending. I am going for a full patent on it. Uh, that process is still ongoing. And uh, I just decided it was something, I think there was something there. I'm not, you know, everybody tells me I'm going to get rich. Well, if I get my money back, I'm happy. But it, I'm retired. It gives me something to do. It helps fill the hours of the day. And, and I think uh, once I get the information out there and people start to see them, I, I do think they'll take off. So they're, this they're, is not just a divot tool, too, right? I mean, it's, this actually has a magnetic ball marker attached to it, too, like some of these divot tools that, that other companies have. And Yes. It, it, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how well you can see it, but it's, it's actually got your uh, divot tool and ball marker. So if you don't need, if you don't need your uh, divot tool, uh, just leave it on the putter. You still have the magnetic ball marker there. Uh, we have, I have on stock over a hundred different, uh, stock markers. And of course we can make them for any course, any business, anywhere in the, you know, whatever right, so, you want. So, you so, so these, these uh, can be, uh, logoed with, with the company logo for business or for a golf course or whatever. Um, it clips right onto your putter. It always stays on your putter unless you're using it. So that that way you never have to worry about forgetting to have your divot tool with you, or you left it in your bag, or or things like poke, that. Doesn't poke holes in your pocket. Uh, the ones that clip to your hat. Uh, I don't know how many times you've ever done it in your uh, golfing uh, years, but you clip something on your hat, whether it's a divot tool or just a ball marker, or a hat clip. Uh, as soon as you get moisture around it or whatever. Uh, a month later, you got a big rust mark on your hat, so you just ruined a thirty-five dollar hat because you got a divot tool or something clipped to it. Uh, all them problems are alleviated uh, because you have it right on your putter. If you have your putter, you have your divot tool and your ball marker. Yeah, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, and uh, and 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 you felt like you know you were tired of always forgetting it and. Heck, if I had it with me, just attached to the putter, then um, and that's you know that's what great ideas come up with is is simplicity and solving a problem. And uh, and when I saw this online, I thought, you know, I'm always trying to help golfers solve problems, 
Um, I'm always trying to help them get better at either um, make make what they're doing more convenient uh, or get them better at their game, um, whether it be through instruction or just knowledge of generalization as to what goes on in golf. And I saw this and I thought, you know, this really this really fixes a lot of issues with worrying about your ball marker and your divot tool. And as you said, poking holes in your pocket, um, things of that nature. And, um, you know, this totally alleviates that. I love the idea that, um, that it clips on that club so that it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going right. to fall off. It's, not, it's, it's really snug on there. And it's probably so lightweight that it doesn't affect the, the swing weight of the putter in any way, shape, or form. Well, it, 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 honestly, I, they weigh an ounce. The, the total weight of the entire tool, putter, uh, divot tool, is one ounce. Uh, now, if it was mounted down at the head of the putter, uh, it might affect the balance of a putter. Uh, plus, it would be in your line of sight. Right. Well, sure. But, but the f- fact that it slides up the shaft, it, it, it's simple. You just snap it on by, down by the head where it's small. You slide it up the shaft. If you're looking at your ball when you're putting, which you should be, uh, you you really shouldn't see the divot tool even there. Uh, now, there are, obviously, putter shafts are a variety of sizes. I don't, <laughs> I mean, I've. I've messed around with uh, changing shafts in my clubs before and stuff, and I don't understand why a putter shaft changes so much. But initially, when I went to uh, go to production with these, uh, I got to thinking about it. Well, just how much of a change do I have to worry about? So I went out to our local uh, uh, sporting goods store, and they probably had 40 putters sitting there to try. I took and I actually sized every single one of them just to see what the variance was. And most generally, they run from like a 500 to 540 diameter. So I decided I'm going to pick the middle of that. And uh, it, it's worked out pretty well so far. Now, I've had a few that's an extra large shaft, right. you know, for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they cut everything off the bottom of the putter shaft when they made the shaft or what. But generally, the ideal size is a 520 diameter. That will uh, enable the, the divot tool to slide right up to the bottom of the grip. Uh, other ones, the other probably most common one is 540. And actually, I can show you right here. This 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 is a 540 here. It's going to come within about four inches of the grip. Okay. But still, even at that point, it uh, it really don't get in the line of sight. For me, I'm a, like I said, I'm pretty much an amateur yet because I've only been golfing for eight years. It don't bother me. So, but you you know you do have those uh, uh, stubborn ways i guess i don't want to say stubborn people i don't want to insult anybody uh but you know some people are stuck in their ways yeah and well, they, that's true you know they they see that they they somehow think they're going to see that and it's going to affect it but honestly like i said if you're watching your uh ball when you're putting like you should you really should never see it and with it up at the grip uh the balance is uh is is not a factor and uh, if you use a straight putter grip like the one I just showed you there, uh, for the one people out there that are familiar with them, that particular grip was a 2.0 putter grip from Super Stroke. Yep. It, uh, if it slides clear way to the grip, it's going to be perfectly level with the top of your putter grip. Uh, and 3.0 putter grips, it's going to actually be below. Now, I have a standard grip here, too. Obviously, it's gonna it's gonna stick up above a little bit, right? But you can always just turn it off to the side too. Sure. It, it, you can put it. You can turn it to the back. At the back, the worst you're gonna see when you're putting is the uh, the back side of the clip. But yeah, it, it really no, it's a should... very it's a very clean looking product. Um, once it's on, I mean, I know that you sent me one. I put it on a putter. Um, it didn't 
it didn't bother me at all. Um, it has a very clean look. Um, it's what I like about uh, it coming up close to the grip is uh, when I go to mark my ball. After the ball's landed, I pull it off. I I fix my divot. I pop it back on there. Um, and then when I go to mark my ball, I'm sitting there lining my ball up. Uh, so I put so I just pop it. It's, it. The grip's right there where my hand is. So I because I'm holding the putter. I just pull pull the ball mark off, stick it down there, line my ball up, put the ball right back on my putter, set up, and uh, and go. So it's it's real convenient. Um, I I like it a lot. So another question that I want to have is for for other people who are who are interested because you know we have a lot of golf professionals who listen to this show um, and watch this show on on the YouTube channel and. Uh, and they they come up with products uh, that they're trying to produce. So give us a little bit of a idea when you start when you came up with this idea when you started to investigate. What was the time frame that it took you to kind of get this get this product from inception to actually getting into the hands of of your customers? Well. Uh... I think uh, summer of 2016 is when I kind of thought of the idea. Now, obviously, it just took me a week or two to find a way to modify the one that I, I bought at the local store. Right. Uh, like I said, I researched the Internet trying to find something that mounted to the putter. Uh, I, I, I Probably two or three weeks, I could not find anything like it on the Internet. Uh, so I had no idea of wh how to proceed to get this to production. So I went to an invention company, uh, and, and, and they did the legwork. They did a, uh, a minor patent search. They looked to see if there's anything, they didn't do an in-depth in search, but they do a minor search. Sure. Uh, they found a couple, uh, products there, but. There was nothing anywhere near like a, a, a standard divot tool with a clip on it. Right. Uh, they had some other goofy plastic things, and I've never seen the ones that they came back with. I've never seen them available on the Internet. Uh, so I, I decided to go ahead and go with them and see what they could find out. Uh, I was patent pending within probably two months' time. That was a fairly quick process. Uh, so they produced the CAD drawings and everything for the product, or, or did you have the manufacturer produce all the CAD drawings when they and just told them exactly what you wanted to do? Basically, basically, I I had done a little bit of the CAD work myself, okay, because of the prototype factor, uh, and then I sent them uh, pictures and I actual one of my prototypes. I had probably a half a dozen of. Them. Okay. Uh, and uh, they sent them on to the patent company, the attorneys and stuff. Then uh, once that process was done and I was patent pending, uh, it was just a matter of whether to try to go for the full patent and stuff. Uh, and then when did, so then how long from then until you started having it actually go into production? Well, I waited like four, four to five months after I got patent pending for the invention company to find somebody. Cause like I said, they, they, part of their uh, fees were to try to find uh, somebody in that particular market to uh, manufacture and actually retail it for you. And you would just get a royalty off of it then. And after the three or four months there, I, they found absolutely nothing. Now, I don't know whether it was the cost of the molds and stuff, which are quite obviously a lot more expensive than a standard divot tool, uh, mainly because of the injection plastic that's on this one. Sure, absolutely. That mold was 10 times the cost of a standard mold. Uh, but they didn't find anything. So I, I just decided that, you know, I, I'm patent pending. I'm trying to get a full patent on this. If they're not going to find anybody, I got to see whether I can find somebody. So after four or five months, I started looking, and I, like I said, I found a uh, 
a company in Georgia that uh, he said he could make anything for me. Uh, he agreed to sign a non-disclosure that he wouldn't compete with my product. Uh, he basically made the molds for me. Uh, he's producing them in his factories. Uh, and uh, the process from actually, I guess to answer your question, I was patent pending in September of 16 and the first divot tools, actual production divot tools, I finally got in January. It took about four months, three to four months to make the molds and then about another three weeks to actually get product. So I was kind of behind the eight ball last year because I'm halfway, you know, we're halfway into the golf season. Most golf courses, this is the time of the year that they're buying all their products. Yeah, no, that's true because it's uh, for the bu the bulk of the, the uh, country, at least in the U.S., um, March, April is when season kind of starts to begin. Yeah, and, especially uh, the northern ones. So they start buying they start buying their products now for the entire year. Right. And the fact I didn't get them till June, and I, and I knew that would be a problem for sales, but uh, I didn't want to wait any longer. I wanted to get them out there and at least get a, a feedback on what would happen. And and I do have them in a couple local courses. Uh, some courses over in Ohio up here have told me from last year when I talked to them uh, that they're interested in them this year. Uh, I don't know whether those courses have opened up yet. Some of them are hit and miss. As you know, we're still, uh, snow's pretty much gone, but we're still fighting 30, 40 degree weather, so it's not yeah. golf weather yet. Yeah, it's even cool down here. I mean, um, it, well, yesterday it was gorgeous uh, down here in Naples, but um, a few days ago it was kind of cool. It was 68. I know that doesn't sound cool to you guys up north, but, but to us down here, 68 with a, with a 10 mile an hour breeze feels like 58 It feels or 55. It feels cold. Um, That's perfect weather up here <laughs> yeah no i know it's it's and i remember when i was in pennsylvania myself for years that uh if it was uh i would golf unless it was if it was over 40 degrees i would go play um i would never play in that <laughs> i'm totally spoiled um you know by living down here and, and i've been down here almost three years and and uh if it drops below uh 60 um even 65, I, I'm not in a, I, I really don't want to play. Um, well, so. I wasn't, I'm not, I'm not quite as dedicated as you was. I need 50 degrees, 50 degrees and I'll go out. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And, and I guess probably if I went, came back up north and I was up north for a while, I'd probably be back to that. I'd, I'd probably go to like 50. Um, I don't think I'd ever go lower than that because I'm not getting any no. younger. So the no, older no. I get, the less, the less my body wants to tolerate the cold. Yeah, and I went out one time here uh, a year or so ago. I, I looked at the temperature. It was in the fall. It was supposed to be 52 for a high. And uh, I thought, no, nah, by the time we tee off, it was going to be 50. That will be all right. It was only supposed to get to 55. So we went out, and unfortunately, I did not check the wind. Yeah. The wind ended up being like 15 to 20 mile an hour all day. It never got to 50. <laughs> And with the wind, it was probably more like 40, yeah. So now I, I, I definitely check the windage, too. <laughs> yeah, the wind the wind chill factor, it's amazing. I mean, like even down here, like I was saying, 68, we had a 15-mile-an-hour wind. It felt cold. I mean, it, it's – and the humidity on that day, too, was very, very low. So that, that really makes it feel cooler, too. So right, it, it's, dry, dry air. Yeah, dry air is colder. So – so it's um you know it's just kind of a uh, when 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 you have to always put that wind factor in there for the way the the feel not the actual temperature but the wind chill feel factor um, can make a big difference. So so have you ever thought about getting this product um in, into uh, big box retail stores like let's uh -huh. say uh, approach somebody like Golf Galaxy or um, or Dix. Uh, or, or maybe even a uh, wholesale like uh, Costco or Walmart? Well, I, I have considered it. Uh, I'm not sure whether you're aware of it or not, but I was. I actually wasn't aware of it myself, but uh, we actually searched at one time to find out where Dick's corporate office was. 
And believe it or not, it's in Coriopolis, Pennsylvania. <laughs> no kidding. I didn't know that. <laughs> Their corporate headquarters in Coriopolis, Pennsylvania. Now, I, I called them one time, and I actually had a uh, – I was, was supposed to get a call back from them, from their, uh, I forget what they called it, their golf expert side of the company. Right. Uh, never transpired, though. It, it never really became a fact. Uh, part of that, I, I'm believing, is still the fact that, uh, okay, who is this guy? One, uh, no sales record. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, I think, to get into them type of stores, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be my uh, challenge to provide a sales record and say these do sell, people do want them, uh, but that's going to take time. Yeah, well, that's uh, true. I mean, it's just like when you know I, I like to watch that show Shark Tank, and, and the yeah. first thing those guys say is, "Okay, what's how much have you sold? You know, this right. past year, and if they see right. that sales are crazy, then they want in on it." Because then they know that the product is going to take off. It just needs a little bit more of a boost um, to maybe fill the orders or whatever it is. So, um, so, so that's yeah, and, something. Yeah, and that... I'll be honest with you. I really, when I started this, I wasn't really that interested in getting into the retail business. I was hoping that the invention company would do that side of it. Sure. And then I could do wholesaling to golf courses corporations and stuff like that that's that's what i was more interested in so i would love a huge retail business to pick these up and and say hey we'll take over all the retail if you want to still do wholesale okay and then just get uh you know if we could come to a deal that both of us would be happy with uh yeah i'd love to have them in because you know it's, it's it's like anything else uh if you're a fisherman you walk into dicks of dunham's uh uh, Golf Galaxy or a Cabela's. Cabela's, Bass Pro Shops. Well, you see one of these new fishing lures come out. you never seen it. Boy, that looks pretty neat. And you want it to catch a fish, but you're going to buy it just because you love the way it looks. It's sure. different. you never seen it before. You're going to buy it. You're going to go out and try it. So if it don't catch a fish, you throw it in your tackle box. So what? Uh, you know, this is the same thing. It's there, there's thousands and thousands of divot tools out there, uh, but there's none that mount to a potter other than our divot tool, and it's a new thing. And and if I had the uh, the uh, ability to have these sitting on retail shelves all across the country, uh, I, my feeling is they would sell. Uh, maybe I'm being biased, but I, I think they would sell. But I don't have that opportunity, at least not yet. Uh, so that's my challenge is to get the product out there. The more I get out there, the more people see them, the more they say, where do you get them? Uh, now, have you thought about maybe uh, um, golf shows? I have. Uh, most I, know, I know a lot of guys who do product and actually go travel around with their product at every weekend to a different golf show. Uh, buy a buy a space, set up shop, sell their product. Um, it might be something you might want to think about, but it's uh, oh, yeah. because it's a good way to get it, it directly into the hands of golfers, especially if it's a low price point. Um, because at those types of shows, golfers are looking for low for 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 neat things that are a low price point. Right, and 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 this is more of a like I said, it, it's that new thing. It's it's never been out there before. Right. Uh, it's just that I'm so new into this. I, I I'll admit I'm I'm still learning a, a whole lot about the business end of it. Uh, finding the right shows, the the affordable shows, I should say. That too. Yeah, it might you might even actually want to think about going to one of those shows and finding somebody who uh, who has uh, different things like this, and then approaching them and see if maybe they would want to purchase the product and sell it at the shows and right. get it to them at a very low discount um so that they can just so that so that you can get guys doing that um not a bad idea so so for the the players um out there who would be interested in this product what's the best way for them to to purchase the product at this moment best way obviously is come to me directly uh 
I have them on various auction sites, and of course, you know, you you're going to pay shipping one way or the other. Uh, but uh, coming direct to me, I don't have to pay fees for the auction sites too. Sure. So the cheapest way to get them, obviously, is coming direct to me. Uh, I do have a website. It's uh, www.fixyourdivot.net. Okay. Uh, you can email me at fixyourdivot at comcast.com or dot net, excuse me. Yeah. Or you can call me at 814-758-0772 or 814-493-7364. And obviously, the more you buy, the, the cheaper they'll get. Uh, right now, I'll ship one out. Uh, for 19.95, and it will include shipping. If you buy additional ones, I'll discount the additional ones. Sure. As long as they're all going to the same address. But online, you know, they're online on various auction sites, but you're going to pay more online if you if you go to them sites. Uh, you can see all the uh, stock markers I have on on my website. You can go to the website and find all the stock markers. And obviously, we can put anything on these discs that. A company or a tournament would want. Uh, it just takes four to five weeks to get a custom disc made. Sure. And uh, we can we can do it. We can also do towels, logo balls, bag tags. My supplier can get me anything they want. Nice, nice. Well, I think it's a great product, and uh, I, I wish you the best of luck. I'm I'm glad that you could come on the show and. And uh, show show it to our listeners and and to our viewers on the YouTube channel. And uh, I wish you the best of luck moving forward with this product, and I hope that it's very successful. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for having me on your show. It's my pleasure. So uh, until we meet again, we always like to say in parting, do your best to keep it in the short grass. And uh, that's a good place to be if you're near, if you're using a divot tool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care. You've been listening to Breaking Par with your host, Bernard Sheridan. Follow us on Twitter at Breaking Par and on Facebook at Par Breakers Golf Academy. Until next week, try to keep it on the short grass.